Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. We've talked a lot on the podcast about the idea of thinking and consciousness, right? What is it that is going on inside our heads, inside our brains that makes us a conscious living being? Of course, a lot of what we know about consciousness is first person, right? We know about our own consciousness from thinking about what's going on inside our heads. What do we know about how other people are doing their thinking? Well, of course, you need to be able to communicate. You can observe people and just sort of be completely scientific about it, but most of our experience with the thoughts of other people comes from talking to them, reading them, talking about them, and so forth. So to facilitate this kind of communication, human beings invented language, a symbolic system that lets us represent things and then talk about them. It's then very natural to ask, how much is the way that we think influenced by our language? When we make different choices about how language should work, those choices can then affect how we actually do our thinking. There's an idea called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Back in the early days of the 20th century, the strong version of it said that language actually determines how we think. You can't think in ways other than the ways that language gives you. No one really believes that anymore, but there's a weaker version that says that language influences how we think, and a growing number of psychologists actually believe that. Today's guest is Lyra Boroditsky, who is a neuroscientist and psychologist. She's Associate Professor of Cognitive Science at UC San Diego, and I got to know her because in her work on neuroscience and psychology and language, she talks a lot about time, right? Time is one of my favorite things, so we end up at the same conferences. But the point is, when we talk about time, interestingly, we very often use spatial metaphors. You talk about moving the meeting forward. What is that supposed to mean? How do you move a thing in time forward or backwards? Does moving something forward an hour mean it's an hour earlier or an hour later? Well, that depends on whether you metaphorically think of yourself as moving forward in time or the meeting as moving toward you as you stay stationary. Neither one of those ideas is correct or incorrect. They're just metaphorical choices that relate a spatial picture to the time language that we use. So Lara has studied how different cultures use language, particularly to talk about time, but in other ways as well. And you'll figure out that not everyone uses just simple forward-backward language. There are cultures and languages that relate time to up and down. There's cultures and languages that relate it to what compass direction you're pointing in or where the big mountain on your island is. This kind of stuff illuminates how we think about the world in very interesting ways. We have a long way to go to figure it out, but Lara's research is a wonderful window onto the weird ways in which we, without even knowing it, shape the way that we think. I wanted to mention that I do have a little project that I'm thinking of maybe trying to start, namely doing a little set of YouTube videos about big ideas in physics as sort of a way to get through the coronavirus epidemic pandemic that we're kind of all facing. Uh, It's not really very helpful, but it's something to do, something to give me a sense of contributing some way. I know a lot of people are at home. A lot of people are worried. Maybe we can have some videos, talk about how the universe works. Maybe that will be a fun thing to do. So look for that, links to that on my Twitter feed and webpage and so forth. And what I hopefully will be doing is releasing short videos and then a couple days later doing also short uh, question and answer sessions where after the first video is released, you leave some questions on YouTube or on Twitter, and then I'll try to answer some of the best ones. So we'll see how that goes. I hope everyone is staying safe washing your hands, social distancing, all those things that we need to do. Um, you know, it's, it's a delicate balance that we have to strike. We have to be careful. We have to take care of ourselves and we have to think about the welfare of others. But we also have to not panic and we also have to keep living our lives. And it's not at all obvious how to do that. I hope you're all doing it the best we can. So with that, let's go. Lara Borditsky, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks for having me. So I am a physicist. I think about space and time, but you know, time, probably my favorite dimension in, in space-time. I wrote a book about 
time and but from a physics point of view and one of the little factoids that i got was that the word time is the most used noun in the english language it is yeah this is sometimes reported as news but it's been true for hundreds been of true years for- <laughs> uh, but actually it's also very commonly used in lots of other indo-european languages so words like time are in the top 10 across lots and lots of languages we is, seem to be obsessed with it is it less true in other in non-indo-european languages i just haven't checked okay we just haven't there's checked there's 7000 languages so yeah there. <laughs> you, can't, you can't look through all of them that's a good little phd but, project but you know we um, we use the word time in many different ways in english so uh, it's a bit of a cheat to say sure. it's the most frequently used word so because we can say how much time do you have? Or how many times have you uh, seen it? Or time after right. time? time? Or this, I'll yeah. see you another time. All of those are actually different uses of the word time. Or you can even say time me, you know, in which case you're using it as a verb. Right. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a cheat, but still, we're talking about time a lot. Well, it indicates because a lot of people think that time is somehow mysterious. Mm-hmm. And certainly we're able to use it, right? We're able to capture it. And, you know, we know what we mean when we say be at the seminar at... 1 p.m. or something mm-hmm. like that. We That operationalizes very straightforwardly into the world. Well, we've created conventions that we require uh, each other to follow, but those conventions um, aren't actually that important in a lot of other places. So if you're living in a village in the jungle, making an appointment for Tuesday, for example, is not that useful unless something happens in your life on a regular seven-day schedule. And actually, yeah. Tuesdays are in some important conventional way different <laughs> from right. other days. Um, if not, then the seven-day week is a completely arbitrary imposition on the flow of time. And in fact, lots of other cultures have different week structures that they follow. Well, this is I really want to get into this about how the interplay of the language that we use and the reality that we perceive around it. But First, you know, you have all these wonderful examples of the relationship between spatial metaphors and our use of time. Mm-hmm. So, I just, you know, why don't we just start with the classic uh, question of let's move next week's meeting forward. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you ask people next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days, what day is the meeting now that it's been rescheduled? Uh, people often have a very strong intuition uh, about what the answer is. Um, but about half the people think that it's Monday and about half the people think that it's Friday. Um, And the reason is we can talk about time two different ways in English. We can talk about ourselves as moving in time. So we can say things like we're approaching the deadline, we're coming up on the holidays. Mm -hmm. So we're moving uh, across a stationary path, which is time, right, from the past to the future. Or we can talk about time is moving. So the deadline is coming up, the holidays are approaching, right? So we're stationary in time, events in time are moving towards us. These are two different perspectives. Uh, And so if you're thinking of yourself as moving in time, then the meeting moves forward in your direction of motion from Wednesday to Friday. But if you're thinking about time moving towards you, then forward is in the direction of motion of time from Wednesday to Monday. And uh, what we find actually is getting people to think about themselves moving in space, like scooting in a chair to Mm -hmm. a goal, or something coming towards them, like uh, bringing a chair to them using a rope, something like that, that will change the the perspective that they take on time. So if you're thinking about yourself moving through space, you'll say the meeting's on Friday. So you prime them in some sense by making them think about this. Yeah, we get them to imagine one spatial scenario or another. And when they're imagining themselves moving uh, in space, they get this seemingly unrelated question about next Wednesday's meeting, and it changes their answer about the meeting because the way we think about right. space and time are so closely related. The 50-50 is fascinating because you, you'll have other examples we'll get to about how people in different languages or different cultures think about it. But this is the same culture, the same set of people using the same words, and still it's almost equally split. Are there correlations between you know personality types? Do like mm-hmm. <laughs> nervous people think of it one way and, and relaxed people think of it the other way? People have tried looking for uh, personality correlations, and there uh, there have been some small studies. I, th- I think it's uh, I think I'd want to see larger samples to yeah, okay. really to really be sure. But you know uh, what we find is that even though people might have an original intuition, like if you don't prime them, they have an original intuition that it's either Monday or Friday. You can get a whole lot of people to switch. So it's pretty uh, loose. It's not deeply ingrained. Yeah, and it's just that that. That use of the word forward is ambiguous in English, just like most other words are ambiguous. It's just in this case, you can get it to be ambiguous to mean 
one thing or the opposite of, the, of that thing. And presumably yeah. it's all completely unconscious that we're even using that as a spatial metaphor, right? We just use the word and people think they know what it means. Yeah, and it's almost impossible in English to talk about time without using spatial words. So, for example, if you want to talk about duration in English, there's no word like duracious. <laughs> right. You have, long. yeah, you, you say long, uh, or you say how much time did it take, right? right? So you talk about amount, you talk about distance. Other languages might have dedicated words for that you use only for duration, not for distance. But mm. in English, it's almost impossible to talk about anything with time without using words that were originally spatial. So you right. might say, I'll see you at three o'clock on Tuesday in an hour. <laughs> right. That's those interesting are, because those most are spatial people, prepositions. Yeah, I mean, most <laughs> people sort of think that the 20th century realization that space and time are part of the same thing was like this big counterintuitive thing, mm -hmm. but they were always at least very metaphorically related to us. Uh, the the way that we think about lots of abstract things that we can't see is often spatial. Mm. So we kind of use our visual spatial abilities to allow us to imagine and organize a lot of other things that are abstract. So whether it's talking about stocks, prices mm -hmm. going up and down, or emotions going up and down, there are lots of things that are kind of nebulous or not directly perceivable by the senses that we just map into space and it makes it seem like we can handle it then in our minds and manipulate it and think about it more easily. And this is probably already hinting at some relationship between how the brain works, right, and how we develop these things. I, I did a wonderful podcast with Lynn Kelly about memory palaces, mm -hmm. you know, building these little structures that have interesting shapes and they let you remember things. So yeah. again, and anal analogizing things in space to things you want to remember makes it much easier. Yeah, we're very, we do have a lot of capacity for organizing things in space. We have a lot of experience of navigating spaces yeah. in our actual lives, in our actual physical experience. And so then we can draw on that to reason about lots and lots of other things. Are we allowed to say that maybe the spatial capacities evolved first before we had a nuanced grasp of time and other things? Uh, I don't know that uh, that would be the case. I think a lot of modern work on neuroscience shows that there are cells that mark uh, locations in space-time. Right. That the things that we used to think were spatial cells are really more like context. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Good. Uh, and so we were at uh, a meeting together about this very idea, <laughs> yes, right? Yeah. Yes. Neurons in space-time. Yeah. Um, and so. Um, Certainly lots of even extremely primitive organisms need to uh, do timing, right? So in order to perform even the most basic motor sure. action, you have to be able to time things. Uh, yeah, you have okay. to move one thing and then the other. Uh, and so uh, certainly very basic senses of time exist throughout the evolutionary tree. The way that we end up thinking about time once we start thinking about um, the deep past or thinking, thinking about moving events and things like that, that of course starts leverage, you know, starts leveraging yeah. a very different system. But even within the human mind, how we do timing is really distributed around the brain. So if you're doing millisecond timing for motor movement, a lot of that is going to be in the cerebellum at the back of your brain. Okay. But if you're thinking about something that's on an order of a second or more than 30, 30 milliseconds or uh, more than 30, uh, yeah, more than 30 milliseconds, it's going to be a little bit uh, further forward in the brain. If it's something like a minute, it's going to be the frontal cortex. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. Okay. So is, is that clearly sort of monotonically related? It's not that it's monotonically related. It's just they're really different functions. Keeping yeah. track of a minute is a really different task than uh, controlling controlling your fingers to play the piano. Right. Even though we would call them both timing, they're There's just, different parts the, the mechanisms are totally different for yeah. doing those things. And you have this wonderful set of examples about how the spatial metaphors and time are different in different cultures. So arrange a set of things in duration, right? Mm -hmm. Or in, I guess, when they happen. In order, and, yeah. and that relates to how you read and things like that? Yeah, there are lots of cultural practices that shape how we, uh, correlate space and time. So uh, reading direction certainly makes a difference. So if you read from left to right, you're likely to think that earlier things are on the left and later things are on the right. Mm -hmm. And so if I give you a set of pictures of someone at different ages, for example, you're likely to put the youngest pictures on the left and the oldest pictures on the right. right. But um, if I give the same task to someone who reads from right to left, like Arabic or Hebrew, uh, then they're likely to put the earliest pictures on the right and the latest pictures on the left. Uh, 
So the way that we scan the world or organize uh, events in our minds uh, is set by this very simple convention of which direction your language is written. Yeah. And even just um, the way you imagine an event unfolding. So for example, if I ask you, imagine Bill is giving flowers to Mary. Uh, draw me a picture of that. Uh, if you ask an English speaker to do that, they're likely to put Bill on the left and Mary on the right. The oh, action okay. is going from left to right. But if you ask an Arabic speaker to do that, they're likely to pull Bill on the right, put Bill on the right and Mary on the left. So they're imagining, quote unquote, the same event, but it's unfolding in these different directions depending on their practice reading and writing. And that must be just some arbitrary accident of history. Which, who chose what, right? Left to right or right to left? Uh, it's a little bit less than arbitrary. It had to do with what kinds of writing implements you had and how oh, much okay. smudging <laughs> you would have depending on what you were using to write with. Or if you're using a, a hammer and chisel, for example, you would hold the hammer in your dominant hand, the chisel in your less dominant hand, as yeah. opposed to if you're writing with ink, you're going to use your dominant hand. Huh, okay. Because most people are right-handed, it makes more sense to go in one direction with some implements and in the other direction with the other implements. So depending on when your writing system was being developed. And some have switched directions when the implements changed. Yeah, I remember thinking when, when I first heard about this stuff, um, even just within physics, there are subfields within physics that draw pictures in their papers of how time is flowing, uh, almost never from right to left, mm -hmm. but frequently from left to right, from top to bottom, or from bottom to top. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, cosmologists and people who do relativity, time flows upward, but mm -hmm. computer scientists, time flows downward, mm -hmm. and I really don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because we use different implements or mm -hmm. anything like that. So. It is, it is interesting. And different cultures have uh, up and down also metaphors for time? Yeah. So in Mandarin, for example, there is a strong up-down metaphor. So earlier events are above, uh, later events are below. Uh, earlier is above. Okay. Yeah, the so past time is Time flows down. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the past is up. The past the is up. Right, the future is down. That's so a safer it's a, way of saying um, it. Yeah. I don't know. Are you, are you moving? Is time moving? Right, okay, <laughs> we have to no. set that also, yeah. right? That's right. So yeah. if we think of ourselves as stationary, then you would say that time is moving. Uh, events in time are flowing up so that uh, earlier things end up further and further up above you. Okay, that's right. Uh, but the way you would use the metaphors in Mandarin would be, for example, to say the last month, you would say the up month, and the next month is the down month. And um, what we've seen, we've seen in a lot of studies is that Mandarin speakers actually do use this uh, organization in their minds privately when they're organizing mm. events and times. How do you test something like that? Um, well, you can do it in lots of ways. I'll, I'll tell you uh, the simplest yeah. one, which is I can stand next to you and I point to a spot in front of your body and say, suppose I told you this here is today, where would you put yesterday and where would you put tomorrow? And then you just have to point somewhere in space. Um, and when you do that, English speakers will almost always uh, organize things from left to right. So they'll mm -hmm. put yesterday on the left and uh, tomorrow on the right. Whereas Mandarin speakers will often organize things vertically, putting yesterday above and tomorrow below. Um, you can also see that in spontaneous gestures. So just get people talking about time and they'll start using their hands because we like to use our hands <laughs> <laughs> when we talk. Yeah. Uh, and so you can see that. And you can also set up uh, little experiments where you require people to push a button that means earlier or later, and you are very meanly either placing that button above or below <laughs> the start button, uh, and uh -huh. you see which one is harder for people. So if they have already in their minds an implicit association that up is earlier, it should take them longer to respond when you've very meanly placed the button in the wrong place. And so you can measure that across lots this of cultures. This is a technique, right, in psychology, because I don't know a lot about it, mm -hmm. of, of figuring out things that people don't even know about themselves by figuring out how long it takes them to do something. Is this How reliable is this? How mm -hmm. good is this? Or is it perfectly uh, established? Uh, well, the technique I'm describing would broadly be a test of implicit association. So okay. you're, you're asking, what implicit associations do people already have? And whatever is automatic or whatever is very ready for you to do is going to be easier to do, right? You're going to be able to do that task faster. And so uh, often we set up exactly the kind of thing I described where you uh, say, well, uh, would it be stressful or difficult for you if I arrange things in a way that's different <laughs> from the norm? And so for English speakers, for example, it doesn't matter for them if I put the earlier key above or below. They don't have a strong association that goes either way. Right. Whereas for Mandarin speakers, they're faster if it's above than if it's below. And so that tells us that there is this implicit association that they have an expectation that uh, those things are associated, that they have to override when I do it the wrong way for them. Right.
if there's one thing that human beings aren't great at, it's predicting the future. We live in a world right now where there's a whole bunch of things going on that were very hard to predict at the time. But what we can do is prepare for a different set of eventualities than we expect. One way of doing this is buying insurance, in particular buying life insurance. It can be a tricky thing to do, but that's where Policy Genius can help. Policy Genius is a website which will let you look through many different possible places you could buy insurance. They're not giving you the insurance themselves, they're helping you find the right policy. You could save $1,500 or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare different life insurance policies. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team handles the paperwork, the red tape, all of that stuff. So if you haven't found a play-by-play -play breakdown of the future inside a crystal ball, that's okay. Be prepared for anything by getting the best price on the right life insurance policy for you at policygenius.com. Policy Genius will always get the future wrong, better get life insurance right. Okay, I just want to keep getting all these wonderful examples on the table. You also have examples of just the fact that we have the words past, present, future, but some languages slice the baloney much more finely than that and some mm -hmm. less, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, the way that languages um, treat time grammatically really differs. So, uh, for example, in some languages, uh, there is no past tense. There is no future tense. There is no. There's no tense marking on verbs at all. In fact, verbs never change. Right? There are so, verbs, but they're not tensed. Yeah. Uh, with some people argue whether or not they're verbs, but okay. <laughs> that's, that's a different yeah, discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the way uh, you would say uh, that you know, if someone, if I show a picture of someone who is about to kick the ball, someone in the process of kicking the ball, someone who's just kicked the ball. Uh, there are some languages where you would just say he kick ball right. in all three cases. Ball and, kick. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then there are other languages that make much finer distinctions. So in some languages, there might be five different past tenses depending on how long something, uh, how long ago something occurred, right? So if it was within a week, that's one tense. If it's within a month, it's another tense and so on. Uh, and so you really have to keep track of how long ago something was and make sure you use the, the correct tense. And does that affect how people think about time? Are they better at knowing how long ago things were if they have those words available? Uh, you know, there hasn't been an empirical test of exactly that, that language that I was just describing as a minority language spoken in Papua New Guinea. So okay. it would be quite challenging to, <laughs> to do. Not, Not that impossible. Many test but, subjects, but, yeah. yeah. But, it, but it, would be, it, it would be really interesting to see. Uh, in general, the prediction would be that whenever you make a distinction, uh, you see things that fall in uh, the category together as being more similar, and you see things that are in different categories that fall at, on different sides of that category boundary as being right. more different. So if uh, your language makes a distinction between uh, you know, things that happened up to a week ago and other things, then you really have a separate category in your mind for things that have happened within the week, uh, and those are seen as different from things that have happened within the month, but not within the week. And uh, somehow in your brain, they keep changing categories as a week goes by. That's they, just yeah, what's weird to me. They yeah, they have to continuously fade, <laughs> <laughs> fade into new categories. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, this is probably an unfair question, but do we know enough about how the brain works to say that these memories are in our brains, but they get re classified as they pass the boundary? Or do we sort of have to think about, oh, that, that was three weeks ago, so okay, it's in this category? I, um, well, we don't know enough about the brain to, to know that. I, I can make an educated guess, which mm -hmm. is that when you're about to tell someone about an event, you're retrieving uh, elements. And when you're retrieving, uh, you're adding information as well. This is true in any, in any retrieval case, right? So if yeah. I ask you about a birthday party that you attended, you'll be able to retrieve some details that maybe uh, you directly experienced, but you're also going to fill in a lot of other details from general knowledge that you have about birthday parties and yeah. what you're like at birthday parties and all kinds of other general knowledge that you have. And so in, it's in that context of retrieval that that information uh, gets added or gets reclassified. So I guess we have this naive uh, metaphor based on computers or something like that, that images or files have timestamps, mm -hmm. right? But probably memories are not quite that simplistic. Although clearly we do have some ability to remember when things happened, but I don't know exactly how it works. Yeah, uh, well, we're remembering context, right? So with every, uh, with every memory, there's going to be context that you store away. You might know 
um, that it must have happened before this because you hadn't yet known about that, or you might know that a particular person was there and you didn't yet know that person before such and such a time. So you can uh, you can often use context to try to. Yeah, I mean um, that's interesting. It's it's not that it has a timestamp. It's that one memory is sort of connected to all these other memories, and we can reconstruct when it must have been. Exactly. We, but we certainly don't have a timestamp. Right. Mostly we're terrible <laughs> at remembering when things happen, which, you know, maybe for the best, it's not usually that important. Um, but uh, imagine if you had an exact timestamp for every every event that occurred. How, how, how fine-grained would you want right. that? Like every time you picked <laughs> up a fork. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think in general you kind of know uh, the relationship between events in your life, more you or think, less. Do you think in general that the fact that we're so used to computers now has given us a bad idea of how the brain probably works because they are pretty different? So we do have a tendency to compare brains to whatever is the most complicated technology available at the time, right? So uh, it used to be that the most common metaphors for thinking were clay tablets, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then after clay tablets, maybe it was the abacus, and then it was a calculator, and then it was a telephone switchboard, because those were very complicated. And then it was the computer, and maybe now it's the internet. And so people draw on uh, whatever complex things they have around to try to understand this other extremely complex thing. Yeah. You see that in all branches of science, right? So in physics, the atom used to be a ball, and then it was a bowl of pudding with raisins in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was yep. the solar system, <laughs> and right. it's a cloud. You know? it's a cloud yeah. And so you have, uh, you have these metaphors that drive uh, hypotheses, that drive thinking, drive debate, um, and they're always evolving. And I guess we shouldn't just talk about spatial metaphors for time, but even, uh, I want to say spatial metaphors for space, right? Uh, how people think about space can be very different. How people think about directions in space, for example. Yeah, so uh, the way that we orient ourselves in space and which dimensions we think are primary really differs from culture to culture. So, for example, we've been talking a lot about left and right, and you organize time from left to right, for example. But... Um, there's some languages that don't really use words like left and right, um, mm -hmm. and instead they do everything in some kind of absolute space. So cardinal directions would be an example, north, south, east, west. And I had a chance to work in a culture like this uh, in Australia. Actually, about a third of the world's languages uh, rely strongly on cardinal directions of some sort. Um, so as opposed to saying forward, backward, left, right, they say north, south, east, west. Not exa not necessarily north, south, east, west. The set, set of directions could could be different. So it could be if you live on a hill, your directions are uphill, downhill, across the hill. Or it could be that your directions are set by the river that you live by, or they're just uh, or they're set by the locations of the mouth and the source of the river, not the, the flow of the river. Right. Or things that are important to your life. Yeah, prevailing winds, <laughs> or or they could just be an arbitrary set of directions that roughly divide things into quadrants but aren't uh, aren't aligned with north, south, east, and west, right? So there are lots of possible systems. On islands, there's often a concentric system where there's a, a direction that's seaward and a direction that's uh, like inland, yeah. like volcano word is a, <laughs> yeah, typical, yeah. is a direction. Um, and sometimes you have mixed systems, like you might have a seaward inland dimension, but also an east-west dimension. And so people use both east-west. That's very common because of the sun, of course. And then you also have this more concentric system that's about how far away you are from the sea. And that does seem like that linguistic convention would have an effect on what you understand. I mean, right now I have no idea what direction north is, right? Mm -hmm. But if I grew up in that culture, I would probably keep track of it all the time. Yeah, in fact, uh, that's that's what we find. Um, People who speak languages that require you to use cardinal directions, for example, do keep track of which way they're facing because you have to, <laughs> to speak yeah. the language. right? So in the community I worked in, literally to say hello, you say, which way are you going? And the answer should be something like, north, northwest, in the far distance, how <laughs> about you? <laughs> right? So you literally can't get past hello. And the social pressure, of course, to learn is very, very strong. You just get treated like you're a nincompoop poop right. if you don't. Um, yeah. And even very small kids there are very well oriented. Uh, so, you know, I could sit down with a four year old and say, hey, can you draw me north, south, east, and west? And they would just make these two effortless lines in the sand, and I would get my compass out and be blown away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. You know, this tiny little human, and you're yeah. like, how did you, do, how did you yeah. do that? What about people whose brains are not completely 
functional. Does that affect how they perceive these things? Uh, you know, we had a chance to test this looking at patients who've had strokes. Um, we looked at patients with strokes in the right parietal lobe. This is a common place to have a stroke because there's a lot of vasculature there, so it's common for things to go wrong. And when you have a stroke there, uh, one consequence often is that you start neglecting things that are on the left side of space, on the other side of space. So these patients might only because eat your right brain controls your yeah, left uh, perceptions. Yeah. Yes. Um, so these patients might only um, eat food on the right side of their plate, or they might only put makeup on the right side of their face, or might only shave the right side of their face. They might only read words on the right side of a page. They just don't, they seem to be unaware of what's happening on the left. Um, and so we wonder, does this also extend to time? So how yeah. concretely is time really on the left or the right? Um, I mean, sorry, can I just ask, mm -hmm. like, for the plate thing, is there part of their brain that knows that they're only seeing the right-hand side and they can just rotate their plate and there's more food there? If you rotate it for them, they'll be happy and they'll eat the other but they side. Won't, they they won't. will If they will eat food on the right side of the plate and complain that they're still hungry. Huh. Um, so there's something else going wrong in their brain so they can't... They're n just not able to uh, bring into consciousness things yeah, okay. that are on, on, the, on the left side. Which is side. amazing. But yeah, it does um, undermine the idea mm -hmm. that there's a separate unified consciousness. <laughs> yeah. So uh, obviously your brain is aware of lots of things that it's not telling you about. It's right. kind of like on a need to know basis with your conscious, <laughs> conscious yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, so if you really stress test this, like if you have something on fire on the left side or if you show a, a, a salacious image on the left side, people might blush. You know. <laughs> well, they might blush, but okay, they might react. not know why right. they're blushing. Interesting. Um, and so... Um, okay, anyway, time. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so we told people, um, these these were patients who read from left to right. They were French-speaking uh, patients in Switzerland. Uh, we told them about uh, a guy, David, who liked doing some things 10 years ago in the past and will like doing different things 10 years from now. These are trivial things. Like 10 years ago, he liked cherries, but 10 years from now, he likes strawberries. Mm -hmm. And these are just facts that they had to remember. And what we found was when we test when we tested their memory, they're much more likely to remember things that were associated with the future, the right side mm. of time. Uh, and if they remembered things from the past, they misattributed them to the future. So if they remembered yeah. something that we said happened 10 years ago, uh, if they recognized it, they mistakenly thought that it had to be in the future. So they kind of squeezed everything in their mental timeline into the part that they could attend to, which is in the right part of their mental timeline. Um, so that to me shows just how deeply ingrained these cultural patterns are, right? So culturally, we've assigned the left side of time to be the past <laughs> and the right yeah. side of time to be the future. It's a completely arbitrary convention. It's an arbitrary cultural convention. And yet, by the time we're grown adults, if you destroy the part of the brain that represents the yeah. left side of space, you also knock out that culturally associated uh, part of time. So it's somehow encoded in the physical brain. It is, yeah. yeah. In ways that we're learning. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's no other option than for things to be encoded in the physical brain. We don't have any other hypotheses. That's true. <laughs> where, Fair enough. But in a way, okay, in a way but that you correlates. Can see it, yeah. yeah, you right, can okay, see it, good. yeah. I mean, maybe this is a digression, but I want to hear more about what this field work is like. Like, how do you find this tribe with this language? How do you visit them? Are they presumably a small tribe? Uh, it's the particular linguistic community is about 200 people. The, the entire community is about 500 people, and there are speakers of five different languages that live together in this okay. community. Um, Isolated as, or part they're, of? Yeah, they're pretty isolated. They live on the west coast of Cape York uh, in this town called Pomparao. It was set up as a mission uh, in Australia. Um, but to answer your question, how, how do you kind of start on this kind of work? Well, you always start with a question or an interesting observation that catches you, and you say, well, I wonder. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and um, so I ended up doing this work with a wonderful collaborator, Alice Gaby, who uh, was the first to describe the grammar of the Kuktaira language that was spoken here. So, so she wrote the grammar for the, lang for the language as her dissertation, and she spent a lot of time in the community. Um, and I got connected with Alice because um, 
I had been bothering one of her advisors for years uh, about, <laughs> hey, you're working with people who speak these, uh, these languages that have this cool way of thinking about space. How do they think about time? Have you noticed anything? Have you noticed anything? Have you, you know, every time I would go to visit his lab, I would constantly bug him. Yeah. And after years, he said, oh, you know what? Alice noticed something. You should go talk to Alice. The progress of science. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I then um, recently was going through some of my college notebooks um, and uh, I'm a very disorganized note taker, and so my notebook contains some, you know, notes on Husserl, and then someone's phone number, a recipe for lamb stew, <laughs> yes. and then a note, yeah. <laughs> a note that said, uh, "Get in touch with such and such a person and find out how speakers of this language organize time. It would be cool if it's in cardinal directions." And I have zero memory of writing that <laughs> note. And then, of course, you know. Uh, 20 years later, you get to do the study. Wow. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was one of these uh, things where you just get interested in a question and you keep asking people who you think might know. And eventually an opportunity opens up and the gift of a wonderful collaborator. And uh, then you get to get to find out the answer to the question that apparently I'd wanted to know for much longer than I remember. Yeah. Did you have to <laughs> learn the language? Uh, no, uh, Alice was my contact okay. uh, uh, on the language front. It's I mean, how many languages do you have to know to do your job? <laughs> Is that a fair question? Um, it's really useful to know about languages, and it's really useful to have wonderful collaborators that you trust who are experts. It. It's always best to have someone who is more expert than you sure. in uh, You're in not going to be language. super fluent in all th thousands of languages. Yeah. But, okay, so what's the answer? Does, it, does, uh, does thinking <laughs> of space as uh, cardinal directions affect how you talk about time? Uh, it affects how people organize time in their minds. So uh, when we asked uh, people in this community to, for example, organize cards that show a person aging, you know, from young to old, um, instead of organizing them from left to right, they organize them from east to west. Hmm. So if they're sitting facing south, they made them go from left to right. But if they're sitting facing north, they made them go from right to left. If they're sitting facing east, they made them go coming towards their body. Right. Um, and for me, that was just the most amazing thing to see with my own eyes. Because it's one thing when you make a prediction, theoretically, you say, well, here's a bold claim. If I think that yeah. the way people think about time depends on space and you build one out of the other, then they should do this thing. But it's a thing you've never seen anyone do. Right. No, 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 that's <laughs> right. the scary part. Right. So, you Falsifiable know, predictions. And, you know, millions and millions of people have been given a task to organize cards, and you've never seen someone do it that way, right? right. And so you sit someone down and you say, let's see what right. happens. And then you see it happen before your eyes. It's, it's, it's the coolest <laughs> thing to see. <laughs> and in a sense, it, it's very weird to us to think that I need to keep track of north, south, east, west when I put some cards on the floor. But maybe it's a little bit less egocentric, right? Like it's not like time revolves around you. It's more stuck in here, inherent in the earth somehow. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's definitely one way of thinking about that pattern of data I just described that says, oh, how weird. They make time go in different directions depending on which way they're facing. Uh. But actually, the other way of describing <laughs> it is, oh, no, they're doing it in a different coordinate frame. So actually, time always goes in the same direction right. in the coordinate frame that's important to them. Right. Yeah. So they're using a qualitatively different set of coordinates. And for them, it, it's the, coordinate, the relevant coordinates are east to west, and time always goes from east to west. And it's me who is making the dimension of time chase me around <laughs> every time I turn my body. Extremely egocentric of me. And is it, this is, again, you know, maybe future research, but are there other correlations? So that, you know, this is a, a whole other category. They think about both space and time a mm -hmm. little bit differently. Can we match that up to other ways, they think? Um, there are lots of things that we would want to explore. Yeah. Uh, it's it's too, definitely too early to make other conclusions. But people have found lots of other cool patterns of how time goes that isn't left to right or right uh -huh. to left, right? So, uh, for example, my colleague here at UCSD, Rafael Nunez, and Kenzie Cooperider did work in a uh, community in Papua New Guinea, the Yupno people. And what's cool about the Yupno is for them, time doesn't go in a straight line. So it rolls into the village at one angle, and then it hits the village, it takes a turn and rolls out at a different angle. Okay, that's just crazy talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, why, this is why I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, right? Yeah. So um, 
because we we have um, traditionally had all these assumptions about how time must go, right. right? So it used to be, well, it has to go from left to right, and maybe it has something to do with handedness because we're right-handed, so people would have that kind of explanation. Or it has to go so that the future is in front and the past is behind because we walk forwards mostly and not backwards, and we have eyes in the front of our heads and not back. Mm -hmm. That turns out not to be true yeah. either, right? <laughs> the past is, for some people, the past right. is in front, it's the future is behind. exceptions to all these logical things. It yeah. has to be in a straight line, of course. How else could it be? But it doesn't have to be in a straight line uh, if there are places around you that are important to you. So in this case, the mouth and the source of the Yubna River are really important locations. And there's no way to make a straight line between them and hit the village. So <laughs> time takes a detour to the village, uh, stops in the village, and then takes a turn and goes in. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean operationally? Like when you say, when you're referring to something a week ago, it's in one direction, and a year ago is in a different direction? Is that yeah, the idea? so if you're lo looking at the way people gesture as they're talking about events in the past and the future, you'll see them gesturing along this bent timeline. Um, okay. <laughs> right. More things in heaven and earth, I guess. Yeah, that's that's very cool. But I think all of this is a testament to the incredible ingenuity of the human mind, right? That we've invented not one way of thinking about time, but so many thousands of ways of thinking about time. And um, probably we haven't invented most of the ones that are still possible. <laughs> <laughs> right. At least all the ones you mentioned are one-dimensional, right? I, I would uh, be I would be tr more troubled if people were thinking of time as two-dimensional because I don't know how to make sense of that. Well, so the example we started with when I say next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days, what day is the meeting? You tell me if you think it's more than uh, one-dimensional. So if people are giving me different answers depending on how they're thinking, whether they're thinking about themselves moving or time moving. Now, if time is one-dimensional and it's like... a, a one-dimensional, unidirectional entity, then it should not matter if I'm moving towards the meeting or the meeting is moving towards me, right? Those are the same thing. Mm -hmm. In space, it matters because there's a fixed ground against which we're moving. So if I'm moving towards you, right. that's different than you moving towards me because there are other things that are staying stationary relative to us. But that requires more dimensionality. It's not, <laughs> right? Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. I think that... Um I mean, number one, of course, part of what Einstein mm -hmm. figured out was that the ground, it, it's perfectly okay to think of the ground as moving if mm -hmm. you're on a train or something mm -hmm. like that, right? So that you can choose your reference frame as you want. But um, even if space were only one dimensional, there could still be ground mm -hmm. and there could still be a reference frame with respect to which you were at rest, I think. Um, the, the thing that is having space be more than one dimensional enables is that you can go in circles, mm -hmm. right? Whereas in time, you can't go in circles. You only go in one direction. Well, a lot of cultures do go in circles. So they think. <laughs> <laughs> so they, may, maybe they linguistically talk about it that way. But Well, certainly people draw, uh, draw diagrams of time that are circular or at least imply a spiral. And we have a lot of cycles built into our systems, right? So we have the week cycle right. where things repeat and the months of the year repeat and so on. And in some cultures, those circles are a lot more prominent as a way of thinking than in others. Yeah, no, the, I mean, the standard uh, paradigmatic mm -hmm. clock is a pendulum going mm -hmm. back and forth, right? Yeah. Repeating itself over and over again. Yeah, no, no, there's def mm -hmm. there are definitely cycles in nature. But um, in general, uh, I have described a lot of things that sound linear. Um, and part of that might be an artifact of the measurement, right? So when you're measuring how people think about time, you give them some cards to lay out, they give you a line. Well, when you're looking at a line, it's possible that what you're looking at is a small part of a really big circle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, very much. <laughs> right. And you're just not making a measurement of the whole system. So if it was possible for us to create a task that measured a lot more of the space, we wouldn't just see a bunch of little lines. We would see a lot of lines that connect in small lines that connect into a sure. circle or a rhombus or some, right. <laughs> some right. other thing. Right. And we're talking about weeks and months and years, but presumably all these different cultures mm -hmm. have their cosmologies or their eschatologies or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they might have guesses or hypotheses about what happens on much, much, much longer timescales mm -hmm. that are different from culture to culture, mm -hmm. right? Hindus have a cyclic sort of cosmology that is like way longer than most Western cosmologies. As, as far as yeah, I definitely people's relationship to uh, deep, deep time, whether it's the past or the future is really different from place to place. Um, I'll, I'll give you two examples. One is um, just how many uh, how many 
steps of causation do you think are relevant to a current outcome? So if I mm -hmm. set up a pool table and I say, here's the location of all the balls, I'm going to make a shot. How, imp you know, how important is this shot for all of the next shots that I'm going to make? Right. So does it, have, okay. does it make an impact the on the second yeah. one, on the third one, on the fourth one? And um, if you ask students in different countries this, everyone will say the next shot, of course, is being affected by the outcome of this first one. But then people start to fall off. And American students fall off after basically like the second or third shot. So by the time you make it to the fourth or fifth shot, they say, yeah, that first shot is no longer exerting a lot of causal <laughs> force. And But students in Korea, for example, will say even in the sixth and the seventh shot, they right. still think it's exerting a lot of causal force. And going the same way in the opposite direction in the past, you say, well, here's the location of the balls that's ended up now. How important was the shot before that, the shot before that, the shot before that? And again, American students have a much narrower slice of time, slice of causal mm -hmm. links that they allow to be relevant, whereas other people have a deeper, have a deeper causal chain that they allow to be built. It's interesting because as a physicist, I can justify either one of those approaches, mm -hmm. right? I mean, clearly the shot that you do right now in principle affects all the subsequent mm -hmm. shots, right? But maybe in practice, there's enough unpredictability that it doesn't affect it in a noticeable way. Mm -hmm. So de it depends on what you care about, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you said uh, also about time being one dimensional as opposed to two dimensional in cycles. And I wanted to tell you about um, the Balinese calendar because uh -huh. it's such a cool example. People describe Balinese time as dense time. So instead of one seven day week, uh, Balinese calendar has 10 concurrently cycling ten, uh, weeks. There's a one day week, a two day week, a three day week, a four day week, a five. Day week. <laughs> and so all of wow. these are, Good you know, have them. their own rhythms, right? And different things happen on different size weeks. So for example, the fish market, might be on the third and fifth day of a five-day week. The vegetable market might be on the fifth and seventh day of a eight-day week. And so there, so you can imagine the kind of complex rhythm that mm -hmm. this creates in your kind of understanding of time. And also there are three concurrent years happening. So there's like the Gregorian calendar, <laughs> there's uh, yeah. the lunar calendar, and there's a solar calendar. And all of these are also happening at the same time. So if you have a chance to look at a Balinese calendar and see all of the markings and designations and colors and additional uh, markers that are required, uh, to keep track of all of these, it's it's really phenomenal. How do they do this before they had laptops and iPads <laughs> and things like that? Like, I can't keep track of my appointments next week. Uh, I think it's uh, I think that's a cultural practice that you see also, for example, in music in Bali. So if you think mm. about the gamelan and all of the cycle, complex cycles of rhythm that happen mm. on the gamelan, where if you're playing one part of the gamelan, you might uh, be a you know on a I don't know eighty seven count. <laughs> Okay. Where you hit on the thirty-one and the forty-seven, <laughs> right? And wow. someone else is on a on a much different uh, on a, a much different set, set of times, and so I think that that idea of embedded cycles that are recurring but are, are of different lengths and things kind of falling into that rhythm that's con that's ever existing is just a, a very important part of the culture that permeates lots of. Things and that's like. that does sound like something that would, I would expect, clearly have an impact on one's cognitive capacities, right? I bet the typical Balinese person is better at juggling all of these rhythms than I ever would be. They're trained to do it, right? And they expect it and so forth. Well, you said then you ever would be. Uh, well, I would disagree with that. I think if you... I'm old and stuck now. <laughs> I mean, if I'd started young, then sure. But now, I don't no, know. You can learn lots of things. It's this okay. idea that you can't learn things later yeah. in life is really silly. Okay, I mean, no, think I, about all I the things. Think about all the things, complex things you've learned since you were six years old. <laughs> it's true. We have this. Ma it's I think true. we have this somewhat magical idea that you know children are the sponges for information and they can acquire these really complex things. And sure, the children are sponges and they learn lots of things. It's very impressive. But adults do pretty well. <laughs> we, we, we come up with some pretty clever stuff. I'm on team adults. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that you called me out on that because I, I am a big believer that uh, you can and should try to learn things, even in, in, in your dotage, such as I am. But, um, but okay, still, I do think that the practice does affect your, your capabilities. You have this other... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Cultural practice, especially something that's built into your language, it's something you're required to do. You have to do it yeah. just in order to be a normal member of your society. You're going to do it. And so it's a daily practice. And right. if there's anything we know from cognitive psychology, it's the things you practice, you get better at. 
Yeah. <laughs> Let me pause for a moment to talk about LinkedIn jobs. You know that when it comes to hiring people, decisions that you make can be the most important decisions for a company, whether it's a mature one or one that is just starting up. LinkedIn jobs helps match the right talent to the role that you have. LinkedIn has over 675 million members worldwide, and LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with all the skills that you're looking for, whether they're hard skills or soft skills. Things like collaboration, creativity, adaptability. LinkedIn looks beyond the work skills and puts your job post in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. It's no wonder a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn. And why companies rate LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. So find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash Mindscape. Again, that's linkedin.com slash Mindscape to get $50 off your first job post. There are, of course, terms and conditions that apply. Okay, I mean, I do want to think that we can keep learning things no matter how old we get maybe but i sometimes wonder whether i'm just whistling dixie like what about learning languages mm -hmm. is it true that we were better at that when we were younger it's definitely easier to learn languages when you're younger than uh when you're older it gets progressively harder but people often use that as an excuse to not learn another language i often have people tell me oh it's too late for me i'll never you know if i start learning french now i'll never be perfect at it i'll never be native like and I always wonder, like, why do you want to be perfect? Are, are you trying to be an international <laughs> spy? <Yeah. laughs> what's, what's, what's the, what, like, because that's the only reason why you'd need to be, pass for a native speaker. It's actually really fun and useful to speak a language, even right. if it's not perfect. You could speak it pretty well. Do you, do you sort of discipline yourself to learn more languages occasionally? Is this part of your... Uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish now. Spanish, and, okay, yeah. good. Yeah. I, I think it's super fun. It's a fun yeah. puzzle where you can actually go in and have an interaction with someone. It feels like you've, you've solved, you've like unlocked right. some kind of mystery. Like you said some words and they said some words back and you got the uh, taco that you wanted. <laughs> and you're like, achievement Success, unlocked. Yes. <laughs> it worked. I um, actually think this more broadly about academics. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there's this idea that we're creative when we're young mm -hmm. and we become less creative when we're older. And maybe there's some of that that is true, but there's an equally good hypothesis that says when we're young, we don't know anything. So we have to work hard mm -hmm. to learn and become an expert in something. Mm -hmm. And when we're older, like we're already an expert in something. Mm -hmm. So we can just keep doing that thing mm -hmm. over and over again. And that makes us less creative, completely irrespective of our cognitive capacities. Yeah. So we definitely get set in habits and we get set in patterns. But uh, once you recognize that about yourself, you can do something consciously about that. right? Yeah. And you can go and learn new things. You can go and have new experiences. Uh, this is one of the reasons that people travel, for example. You end up in a different context. And those times that you're traveling, that you're away, they expand in memory. So you might have a, a week of vacation. Oh, yeah. And that week of vacation takes up so much more space in your memory of the year than the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Because you have new experiences new. in a different context. They aren't just automatic repetitions of the, your normal routine. Um, and so whether it's uh, learning languages or having new experiences, uh, jostling yourself to do something new uh, creates that opportunity for creativity. So as a professional cognitive scientist, <laughs> would you sign on to the idea that uh, continually surprising yourself and trying new things keeps you young in terms of your brain function? Uh, there are definitely lots of studies that show that. There's yeah. a use it or lose it uh, feature. Um, it's true with languages. So uh, people who acquire a second language are uh, somewhat protected from Alzheimer's and onset mm -hmm. of dementia late in life. But that's also true for any active hobby that people keep up, right? Okay. So if, whether it's digital photography or something else that requires you to use your brain in new creative ways, uh, that, will, uh, that will help you stay active. And I always tell people that the right, the right time to learn another language is now. Uh, <laughs> it does get harder as you get older, but right. unless you have a time machine, you can go back okay. to when you were younger. Uh, your only option is now, and now is better than any other time that's later. So. I need to get some like language learning course to advertise in the podcast. I feel, I feel good about that. <laughs> it's a great idea. And it's not just time. You have mm -hmm. another example which speaks to this point about colors, about the, you know, the light blue and dark blue. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's a very simple example. Again, when language makes a distinction between two things, requires you to make a distinction between two things, you get a lot of practice distinguishing them. So in Russian, uh, there isn't a single word that covers the entire spectrum of blues in English. So there's not a word that covers everything from the lightest blues to the darkest blues. Instead, there is a a separate word for light blue, голубой, and uh, another word for dark blue, which is sini. And so Russian speakers have to call different shades of blue by these two different names. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you test their ability to distinguish uh, blues that either fall in one Russian category or in two different Russian categories, they're faster to tell the difference between what they would call Golubo and what they would call Sini, whereas for English speakers, they're all just blue. <laughs> right. So we can tell that they're different, but it takes us longer to recognize the difference than it would a Russian. Yeah. In general, uh, this is true across languages. Uh, you can test English speakers across the blue-green distinction and things that you would call blue as opposed to green, colors that fall on either side of that boundary, mm-hmm. you will be faster to tell the difference between than two different blues or two different greens that you right. would call by the same name. And there's nothing spooky about that. It's practice. That's what they're used to doing. It's practice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so now it's, we're bumping up against the, the big question, which is how we talk versus what is real. Does language bring reality into existence, or is it a simple representation of reality? Like, uh, I, think, I think even men and women, even in the United States, label colors slightly differently, mm-hmm. right? And certainly uh, the evidence you just said, uh, Russians and English speakers label colors slightly differently. Does that mean that we see differently? Are we perceiving the world differently? And we're going to go way beyond colors to much more deep and important concepts there. Yeah, so it, all, of course, all we can measure in experiments is how people behave, right? So I can say, does it take you longer to make this distinction or not? Are you more likely to confuse these two colors in memory? Are, um, are you more likely to make an error when I'm asking you to make a distinction? Uh, what I can't Uh, tell you from any of those results is what your experience of that color is, right? So if your question is, uh, do Russian speakers see those colors as differently, experience them as somehow differently? Uh, I can't tell you what anyone sees in the eyes. That's a problem. It's a problem with consciousness and all these questions. Yes, perception is a private experience. So ultimately, that's beyond our tools of measurement. So all all we can do is say, how how efficiently can you make this judgment? How uh, likely are you to be correct if we stress the system? Things like that. And from that, we can can say, well, the brain seems to, to have an easier time making this distinction than that. We can also make... Um, measurements directly from the brain and say, oh, uh, the brain of a Russian speaker responds if you shift the colors from light blue to tar- dark blue. You'll get a surprise response. Or so this is a, like an MRI machine or something? Or uh, how I'm, do you I'm poke just, into the brain? <laughs> I'm describing EEG results where okay. you're, you're measuring a very fast response that just kind of uh, says something has changed, right? So it's like a surprise marker. Yeah. And uh, if I show you a series of blues, when I've crossed the boundary from light blue to dark blue, the brain of a Russian speaker, a Greek speaker, for example, will give that surprise response that says, oh, we've, we've shifted categories, something new is happening. Whereas the same series of colors will not give that response in okay. an English speaker's brain because nothing, the category isn't changing, right? So again, we can tell that the brain is treating these things differently, but I can't tell you that mm-hmm. people see things, and anything about how anyone sees right. anything, really. What was it? Was it the sapir Whorf hypothesis? Am I getting it right? Uh, that, sapir uh, Whorf, yeah. Sapir? Sapir. Sapir, sapir Whorf. Mm-hmm. Uh, that basically said that our, our language controls what we see. How, how, how would you phrase the hypothesis? Uh, there are many different versions of the hypothesis. Uh, so Benjamin Lee Worf um, died young, and a lot of his writings were published posthumously. So they're like, imagine all your notes that you haven't. Oh no, <laughs> they're going to be burned. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, in his writings, he says lots of different things. Uh, a very strong hypothesis might be that. Um, language controls thought and you could never have thoughts that are outside of your language. Right. Good. Uh, another version might be that language is one of one of the contributors to how we come to see the world and it might be a stronger influence in some domains mm-hmm. where there's less, less information from the world, it might be a less strong influence in others. Um, but in general, there there is this interesting idea out there that says, um, Maybe language is a straitjacket for thought. Maybe we can't, ah, okay. we can't think outside of the bounds of our language. And I think this is a particularly odd idea because you, know, you can always learn new ways of talking. Right. <laughs> right. 
Uh, and also, to invent any feature of a language, you have to have at least partially the thought first. And so it seems to me that language can't be truly uh, a straight jacket uh, for mm -hmm. thought, but language can certainly encourage patterns and entrench us into ways of thinking so that we don't even consider other options. I mean, I always, you know, thought of what about an instrumental piece of music? Mm -hmm. like, I can think of that. Like, it's mm -hmm. in my brain, but it's not in the form of language. So like the most naive reading of that hypothesis can't be quite right. Yeah, so Wittgenstein makes this uh, wonderful example or to just to show that some things are very expressible in language and others not. So if, he says, if I ask you, what's the height of Mount Kilimanjaro? If you know the answer, you can easily express it in language. But if I ask you, what does a clarinet sound like? Uh, <laughs> it's yeah, going to be really hard, right? right? If you don't already know what a clarinet sounds like, I'm not going to be able to say very many useful things that will really help you. And so um, there are definitely a lot of, there's a lot of mental activity that it, uh, exists outside of the purview of language or is not as effable uh, right. as other things. Yeah. <laughs> and my impression is that the superior war of hypothesis was popular and then faded and maybe is getting a little bit of a comeback. Uh, it was uh, popular when Worf was writing. People were. So when was that? Um, it, uh, he was writing in the 30s and 40s, uh, but a lot of his writings were then published uh, after after his death. There was a collection of them published in the 50s, um, but there wasn't really any research uh, about mm. it, right? So it's one thing for the idea to be popular, right? Uh, it's another thing to actually go and do experiments. And one of the reasons is that uh, all of the people doing work in communities that were not just, you know, colleges in the U.S. with English speakers, in, you know, English-speaking sophomores who are are, are subjects Our normally. Our favorite subjects, yeah. yes. Um, all of those people weren't using the tools of cognitive psychology or psychology in general. They were linguists or anthropologists. They were doing descriptive work. And so when they would come back from their field sites and say, well, I worked in this community and they do this, um, Psychologists would treat that as like interesting stories in travel journals. They yeah. would be like, "Oh, well, that's that's a lo it's lovely that you had that trip right. and you, a little <laughs> you, know, color. you had that experience, okay. but it's not science." Uh, and but at the same time, psychologists were completely shielded from being able to discover any of these fascinating differences because they never left their labs, and the only people they ever tested were English-speaking sophomores. And so, if that's the only people you ever test, you never see yeah. evidence of diversity. So you're, you've conveniently uh, protected yourself <laughs> from discovering any any interesting phenomena, right? And so, I mean, is is there a time when that began to shift? Um, in the mid 1990s, okay. uh, finally, there, there there started to be a marriage uh, where inspiration from uh, field linguistics and linguistic anthropology started filtering into psychology and then psychologists started collaborating with linguists and anthropologists to design experiments. And it, it it's a relationship of building trust across those disciplines because different fields have different ways of knowing and different things sure. they trust to be true. Yeah. And definitely as a, you know, I'm trained as an experimentalist, so I believe data. I want things to come from a controlled experiment, and if there's not two columns of numbers I can compare, <laughs> I'm not. You know, it's not. It nothing is true, right? right? But at the same time, I've also come to see how much um, of our interpretation of the data has to rely on a rich understanding of the context in which you collected the data. So if I go to a community for a week and do an experiment. Um, 5% of what I learn is the data that I got in the experiment, and 95% of what I learn is just being there and seeing how people interact and how whatever practice I'm trying to measure in this little toy experiment actually lives in the community and how, how it performs. And that gives me so much more comfort in interpreting the data and making sure that I'm not just grossly misinterpreting what the two columns of numbers are saying. Does that pose a challenge for the practice of science in that it's harder to objectively communicate what you've learned in a journal article than it is for some quantitative data? Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm still an experimentalist, so I'm always, I'm, I always am at the end of the day doing a controlled experiment yep. and doing statistics on the data. So. Um, that's true, uh, but I think it is a really interesting challenge for all of the behavioral sciences and all of the social sciences to think um, who our subjects of study are, right? So mm -hmm. when we're talking about humans... There are people, yeah. As a <laughs> physicist, I can avoid this problem, right. but you can't, yeah. Yeah, when we're talking about humans, 
Um, usually people will just test American undergrads and say, we've, we've discovered how humans do something. They're a very strange kind of human. That's a very, <laughs> very unusual kind of human. And so um, how do you actually create a rich understanding of the human mind in all of the different contexts that it exists? And the incredible ingenuity and flexibility that you see around the world in all of these different contexts. That to me is the real cool stuff yeah. that human minds do. And the more we constrain the set of people that we study, the less we're actually allowing ourselves to understand the, the real meat of what it is to be human and what it is to have this cool human brain that can do all these things and is so flexible. And even if language does not absolutely restrict what we can understand it does so it does seem that the pendulum is swinging towards thinking that it affects how we understand things and maybe in a profound way maybe not just you know colors and directions it definitely creates habits of thought uh, it lays down patterns that are easy to follow and then you follow those patterns and in some cases it um, creates uh, foundations for whole realms of thought so the domain of number is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in English, we have numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Everyone learns those numbers as did a kid. Did we always have those? I mean, in the <laughs> European, did we, I guess zero came late. Zero is very late. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the decimal positional system that we use now for representing numbers, I, I think, comes to Europe in the 1700s with yeah. Fibonacci, right? So he takes it from the Arab world, which took it from India. Um, the idea of counting numbers were always there in Indo-European language. Uh, always is a long time. Always a long time. I should, yeah. <laughs> we don't know about always because um, you know language doesn't leave a, a, a physical trace in the fossil record. Yeah. So when you go beyond the written record, which is very very short uh, for the human race, we actually can only make inferences about what might have been uh, there. So uh, it's extremely unlikely that. Always is yeah. true. No, that was, I was exaggerating <laughs> again. You caught um, me. Very good. But there are lots of languages that don't have exact number words or have words that are just one, two, three, few, and many. Mm -hmm. Some languages don't use uh, a base 10 system for their number system. They use base 6 or base 8, or base 12, or base 87. <laughs> yeah, the 87 is weird, but okay, you know, go nuts. Uh, uh, 81 is true. I definitely know of a, uh, of a language. I think 120 uh, was something, but... The Babylonians had a lot of things that were based on uh, 60s and 20s. Um, so 120 you get from uh, units of 20. So that, that was a common thing. In general, uh, body parts are good. So 5, yeah. 10, 20 are common. But then some people use a different way of thinking about body parts. So for example, they might use uh, links on your fingers. And so you get 12. Uh, some might use knuckles, in which case you get eight. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And some people, for example, there's a, a group in Papua New Guinea that has a base 27 that just starts with the fingers on one hand and goes across the top of your body, including, oh. including parts of your face and your head and goes on the other side. And so, and then when you need to go above 27, you just go in the other direction. And so you say, you know, uh, a second elbow, Over second once. time back. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. And the body part terms are actually the names of the numbers. So, like, if you want eight potatoes, that's elbow potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, languages have all these different systems for numbers, and some don't have exact numbers at all. And that's a case where, uh, as you said, zero came late in human civilization. So, there are millions of humans running around trying to think about things, and it takes a very special one or group of humans to come up with this very useful innovation of zero that makes it a really good number system that you can then, you know, like better than the Roman numerals that yeah. Europeans had before, for, <laughs> certainly for mental calculation, right? Um, but we all have, we all now completely take it for granted. So you and I know the number system. It's impossible to imagine not knowing it. It's impossible right. to imagine it ever not being in, in your language. But someone had to invent it. And it's not something that's a project for a Tuesday. No, no, <laughs> like, no, no. It took a really long time for that to come about, and it didn't happen in, uh, in very many places in the world. Uh, and so, um, but now we have it. And so we're like, we're such ungrateful punks. We take mm. it for granted. We're like, well, of course, it always existed. <laughs> I would have I thought of it if, even if uh, someone didn't. But it's all this cognitive labor of all these people that is just built into language. And now five-year-olds 
right. have the cognitive skills that used to be only available to a very few adepts, uh, even just 500 years ago. Because of that legacy of the, the built-in structure of the yes, language. Yes, because it, it's just, yeah. uh, now it's part of the language and everyone is trained on it from early on and you don't even remember learning it and I'm completely ungrateful for it. But even notions like um, causality, uh, influence, and you mentioned the billiard balls, mm -hmm blame and intentionality, these are all built into how we talk also. Yeah, whenever something happens, you have to construe it in some way, right? Yeah. So there is a physical event that occurs, but then you also have to think about, did it just happen? Did someone do it? Yeah. Whose fault <laughs> is it, Whose right? fault is it? Um, is it an and, accident? Yeah, and there's so many different ways that language allows you to uh, construe or describe any given event. So for example, um, uh, let me give you a famous accident when uh, Dick Cheney went out hunting with uh, his buddy Harry oh, yeah. Whittington and shot him uh, accidentally uh, in the face. In the face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, you could say Cheney shot Whittington. You could say uh, Whittington got shot by Cheney. You could just say Whittington got shot, leave Cheney out of it altogether. You could focus on the manner. So you could say Whittington got peppered pretty good. Uh, that was a <laughs> headline from a Texas newspaper. Right. Um, Cheney himself, when he was apologizing, said, ultimately, I'm the guy that pulled the trigger, that fired the round, that hit Harry. Um, so I'm the guy that pulled the trigger yeah. <laughs> the so, round. So he takes this, you know, it doesn't take a very long time to shoot your friend <laughs> in the face. It's a split second physical right. event. You'd think it's pretty simple, but he takes a split second event and breaks it up into a long chain. And he just happens to be on one end of that causal chain. Bush actually did one better. He said something like, he heard a bird flush and he turned and pulled the trigger and saw his friend get wounded. <laughs> so in that description, Cheney transforms from agent to mere witness by the end of the sentence. This is a masterful yeah. exculpation, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, now, those ex I give you those examples. They're funny like examples of linguistic wiggling, but we have to do this all the time. Whenever you're choosing a verb, you're choosing how much time you're going to compress into an event. So I could say, uh, we built Rome, we cured polio. Uh, well, a whole lot of things had to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of events, there's right. a lot of time, right, for any of those things. Uh, so I could use one verb for those extremely complex, long-standing processes, or I could use four verbs to say I shot my friend in the face. So you're always make, taking a perspective when you're choosing a verb. And you're also taking a perspective depending on whether you say I broke the vase or the vase broke or it so happened to me that the vase broke. Uh, you're shifting blame, you're shifting responsibility. Languages choose differently how to describe events. So in English, for example, we are not that careful about distinguishing accidents from intentional actions. So you can say things like, I broke my arm, where you know, in lots of other languages, um, you wouldn't say that unless you were a lunatic looking to go break your arm and you succeeded, <laughs> right? You would right. say something you like, my arm got broken, yeah. it so happened to me that my arm broke. But in English, whether it's intentional or accidental, it's common to say an agentive thing, like he broke the vase, I broke my arm, I lost the library book. Uh, if you try to say I lost the library book in Spanish, people will look at you and say, why would you why do that? Why do you do that? <laughs> what kind of person so would So do in that? Spanish, it would be different constructions for I lost the library book intentionally or lost it by accident. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're a weird person who intentionally <laughs> loses a book. <laughs> but you would, you would express it as something like, yeah, the look, the book got lost, or the book lost itself to me, or something mm, like okay. that, right? Yeah. Uh, because you didn't intend to to do it. But in the case where, say, you you broke a vase by accident, in in English, you would still say, still say I broke it. That's normal. And if you don't say I broke it, if you say something like it broke, people think it's evasive, mm, right? Yeah. Whereas in lots of languages, you would have to use a different construction. Well, writers are taught not to use the passive voice because it is it is yeah. less. Active, it's weaker, right? Yeah, this is a, a, a like agentive, non agentive is a little different for passive, little different, yeah. passive active. But let me give you uh, an example I love. So uh, take uh, Caesar, Romeo, Socrates. So Socrates drank the poison. Socrates was forced to drink poison. He knew that he was drinking poison. He had to do it. He was sentenced to death by poison, right? Uh, Romeo drank the poison. Um, he uh, uh, meant to drink poison. <laughs> he mm -hmm. was intentionally drinking poison. Right? Caesar drank drink the poison. Well, Caesar thought he was drinking wine, but 
uh, his wine was poisoned. So he's intentionally drinking, but unknowingly to him, right. it's poison, right? So, but in English, we can say he drank the poison in each case. Caesar drank the poison, Romeo drank the poison, Socrates drank the poison. There are languages where those three would require different grammatical constructions because in those languages, it's important whether someone is doing something knowingly, whether they're doing something willfully, mm. <laughs> uh, with, whether they're, you know, it's volitional. And so in uh, Devehi, for example, this is a, a, a language spoken in the Maldives, you would use three different constructions for those three different guys yeah. because they're circumstances that are importantly different and have to be marked grammatically differently in those languages. And and just like the ability to you know keep track of numbers and so forth, I presume this does have an effect on how we conceptualize the world a little bit. I mean, this is probably full employment for you and people in your <laughs> lab to figure out do we assign praise and blame differently if we speak one of these slightly different languages? Are we more willing to let things slide or are we more dodgy? <laughs> yeah, well, so let me give you an example just from English. Um, uh, we did this experiment right after the Super Bowl where Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake performed together and they had mm -hmm. this very famous incident that became the world's first wardrobe malfunction. Right. So the term wardrobe malfunction was born after that incident. and. Um, the reason we chose that incident is we wanted something that was uh, saturated for people, that they had seen it many times before and they knew a lot about it. They'd seen it discussed in the news, it, you know, uh, in case people don't remember. Um, in the final dance move, Justin Timberlake reached across Janet Jackson's chest and then for nine sixteenths of a second, uh, one of her breasts was partially exposed on national television, and this was extremely scandalous. Decline of the West. Uh, yeah. Yes, the the FCC uh, tried to fine CBS five hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the indecency, and um, people were so outraged it quickly became the most TiVoed event of all time. <laughs> I, I assume they just had to so go, outraged. yeah, go back and review it just to make sure they were extremely outraged yeah. uh, yet again. <laughs> Um, so uh, we thought, well, what if you take an event that's even this saturated and you can see it yourself with your own eyes? You can, quote unquote, go to the tape, yeah. right? So we have the sense, in, you know, we have Not this expression in English. Yeah. Let's go to the tape as if, if you just see it with your own eyes, you'll have direct perception of reality, right? So we say, okay, well, let's go to the tape for something that you've already seen many times anyway. Could we still change the way people blame and punish the people mm. involved, depending on what grammatical construction we use to describe it? Okay. And so we show people the video. We tell them either uh, he unfastened the snap or the snap unfastened. And then we ask, how much is he to blame? And how much of the $550,000 should he pay? And not only do people blame Timberlake more if we say he unfastened the snap, but they also want to charge him 55% more in fines. Mm. All right, so... Uh, so the rubber hits the road, as it were. Yeah, like they really... Yeah, so even though you have this feeling like, I can see what happened, I can see it with my own eyes, the way that we describe things, the way we tend to describe this, things or the way things are framed for us by other people makes a real difference even when you can see things with your own eyes. Yeah, and presumably this pervades everything in ways that we don't even know. I mean, an obvious thing to discuss is gender in language, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there are ongoing questions about pronouns mm -hmm. in English, but other languages are way more gendered mm -hmm. than English is. And some and, are way less gendered. And some are way less, mm -hmm. right. And uh, so, I mean, one question is, um, when I took German in high school, mm -hmm. I was told, sure, there's, you know, der, die, and das, there's mm -hmm. these genders, but they had nothing whatsoever to do mm -hmm. with, you know, the sex of human beings mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I was always a little bit suspicious mm -hmm. that there was zero connotation in the mm -hmm. brain. Do we know anything about how the existence of those different labels affects how people perceive the different things? Yeah, so this is a, a coming back to the question you asked earlier about to what extent does language reflect reality or to what extent is it creating its own right. reality? I think this is uh, a really wonderful example of how language creates something that is completely unrelated to reality. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we have these grammatical gender systems where every noun is masculine or feminine. So chairs, tables, watering cans, toasters, all, ha all are either masculine or feminine. And the amazing thing is speakers of those languages actually take those as meaningful, right? And uh, so if you ask, um, even young kids, for example, can you assign voices for animated characters? So we're going to have a toaster be the star of this animated film. What voice should it have? Uh, young kids who are learning Spanish or French as their first language will pick a boy vo voice or a girl voice depending on the grammatical gender of mm -hmm. the noun. Yeah. 
adults will give you different descriptions of a, an object, like a bridge, depending on whether it's masculine or feminine in their language. And if you ask monolinguals of one of these languages, why is this word masculine in your language, or why is it feminine? They'll say, well, it reflects some reality about the world. No, <laughs> right? it's completely my, different in a different language. Exactly. My language has intuited something that is otherwise invisible about this object. You know, the sun is masculine because it is truly masculine, and my language is simply picking up. Like, isn't it amazing that French is such a sensitive language? <laughs> it's picked up on the true right. genders of all these inanimate things. Uh, Whereas once you find bilinguals who speak two languages that have different gender systems, then they start to see, oh, well, this is just a formal property of the language, and they won't, they won't say that. So I think we believe the structures of our languages a lot more than we should. Yeah. We often believe that the categories that happen to exist in our language are the structure of reality. But in fact, lots of other categories are possible, and those categories could be collapsed, or they could be refined. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and all of those are simply models. So when we go back to gender for humans, for example, uh, if you have a language that requires humans to be either male or female in the language, so you have to have he or she and there's no other way, it's easy to come to believe that that's a necessary distinction and you could not think of a human unless you put them in one of those two categories. But if you speak a language that doesn't actually make that distinction, lots of languages don't have any gender marking. In that case, it's not a problem. It actually doesn't even occur to you as a thing to worry about, yeah. right? Uh, and I mean, so, it's only one of a million different ways we could distinguish between people. Right. Uh, that we yeah. Assigned a pronoun to. Well, uh, I mean, it's it, it is interesting that gender is one of the only things that languages uh, mark on pronouns. Some languages will worry about age. Uh, so there there are a couple of other things that get encoded, but gender is one of the only it's things that you thing, encode. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you could argue that from an information point of view, other things might be more useful, like you could encode height or eye right. color or education level <laughs> or, yeah. you know, ability to curl 20 pounds or <laughs> whatever it is that you could want you, you could want to know about someone. But we focus on this. But also people of, often feel very, con, very uh, attached to whichever specific way langu their language does gender. So, for example, in English, uh, people might be... Uh, very adamant that you can't replace he and she with they because you have to have gendered pronouns and how could you speak a language that doesn't have gender? Like, what would pronouns even mean? And I always point out that, in fact, almost all pronouns in English are already gender neutral. So I, we, they, you. <laughs> in right. fact, only third-person singular pronouns have gender. And I've never heard someone say, you know what, we really need to add more gender to the other pronouns. Some languages do that. Thai has different gender words for I. Hebrew has different gender mm -hmm. words for you. Uh, Spanish has different gender words for uh, they, plural, <laughs> right? Um, so you could advocate for that, but I've just never heard someone say that. Yeah. People feel very attached to whichever way their language happens to be in the moment. But these things do can and do change. So, Do you think it is changing? Do you think we're going to switch to a they, third-person, universal pronoun? Do you think we should? So singular they has existed in English for a really long time. There mm -hmm. are lots of classical uses of it um, that people don't even hear as strange at all. Right. So if I say, if anybody calls, tell them I'm not home. Mm -hmm. That's an indeterminate person. I'm not insulted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Uh, you can find these examples in Shakespeare and Jane Austen. It, right. You know, it's it's an old use. If in, you in know English. the gender of the person, then you use he or she. Uh, but if you don't use they, yeah. And uh, so uh, the use of singular they is on the rise in English. People like it. They use it. And so as it becomes more popular, if people continue to like it and use it, it's going to sound more and more normal. And the few cases where there is some ambiguity or, uh, or difficulty in parsing because you don't know if it's singular or plural, you'll just resolve those with context over time or people will come up with other solutions. Um, whether something... Whether I would prescribe something is like they should or shouldn't. I think um, it really depends on what purpose you're trying, what goal you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. right? So um, a lot of languages are trying to come up with gender-neutral ways of speaking because categorizing people into just two categories uh, misses a lot of people who don't feel like they could cleanly be categorized into the, those two categories, or sometimes because they feel like it puts too much emphasis on gender. And the first thing that you experience about right. someone is gender. It allows implicit bias to creep in and so on. But other languages are adding more gender, right? So, for example, in French, 
uh, the Académie Française, that's the, the the body that decides what yeah. is and isn't part officially part of the, the French, King of French language. Yeah. Yeah. They've just approved a whole bunch of new feminine forms for professions. Uh, oh, and yeah. so the idea is that it creates visibility for the fact that there are female surgeons and there are female soldiers and there are female bosses and there are female presidents, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could say that's a good thing because if there are women doing those jobs and you hear the feminine form, it creates a norm that women do yeah. exist in these positions of power. Um, but at the same time, it, uh, it has a potential to backfire because uh, for a lot of cases, it doesn't the gender of the person doesn't matter for their job, right? So if I say um, the statistician delivered the results or something like that, well, if I'm required to mark that it's a female statistician as opposed to a male statistician, does that allow you to start thinking about your gender biases, <laughs> about who right. can do math and who can't do math? Is a female statistician a different job than a male statistician in the same way that actress is seen as a less prestigious job than actor or waitress is seen as a less prestigious job than waiter? The female actors I know in Hollywood like to be called actors. Exactly, because there's more prestige associated right. with uh, the male term and there's more pay associated with it. But I don't, I don't know French very well. Is the, is the, are the existing French nouns implicitly male marked? And they're trying to add a female version of it. So, like, I can I can imagine women not wanting to say, "Well, I'm doing I'm, I'm a man doing mm -hmm. that job either." So it's a sticky situation. I don't know what where to go. Uh, the forms uh, for a lot of jobs, the forms that exist are explicitly masculine forms, and so the Académie Française yeah. has just approved okay. the feminine. Ver Almost any profession can be easily feminized in French. The way that French is. Uh, is constructed. It's just that they weren't approved as official right. things that you could put in a newspaper. So, like, you for turn example. e n to e n n e or something uh, like that. Yes. Yeah. Or add an e at the end to yeah. some, okay. depending on the, uh, right. the structure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, how? So, this is a good place to wrap up. I mean, you're a scientist. Mm -hmm. You describe what happens in the world, how mm -hmm. people talk, how it affects their lives, and things like that. But you're also a person. You, mm -hmm. you know, you have some uh, uh, preferences. Mm -hmm. uh, how? How much do you either feel or need to resist the uh, urge to be judgy, to say, well, it would be better if we spoke this way? Like, you know, you appreciate a lot more than the average person how the way that we use language affects how we think about things. Mm -hmm. Does it make you want to go, oh, just talk this way? Oh, well, I think of language as a tool, right? And so I think that the way you talk should serve the purposes that you're trying to achieve. And so for me, for example, with respect to gender, I think it would be really great to have gender as something that's optional. So when you want to include it, when it's relevant, you include it. Mm -hmm. And when you don't want to include it or it's not relevant, you don't include it in the same way that you do for almost any other personal characteristic. Mm -hmm. So I can talk about you without ever mentioning your height or your eye color <laughs> or your religion or your profession. Uh, and if I want to include that information, it's optional, I can do it. It's, it's not hard, it's not forbidden, right. <laughs> right? But it's just not part of every single utterance. Yeah. And so I think that system is, uh, would be really nice. So uh, if, if, I had, uh, if I had to make a new language, I would make a language that makes it possible to not include information mm -hmm. when it's uh, harmful or problematic to include it, and then to include it when it's useful. And in this language, would time move from left to right or right to left? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, in English, time uh, doesn't move left to right or right to left in the language itself. The language right? doesn't. Do some languages do it? There is. So every time I say on the radio that English doesn't lay out time from left to right in in metaphor, so we don't yeah. say Tuesday is left of Wednesday, for example, I get a phone call from someone in the military that says, actually, we say that. And it's because in the military, they have this calendar, this perpetual calendar that runs from left to right, and everything is scheduled in that left to right stream. Okay. And in fact, it's starting to become a linguistic metaphor. So people, when they're shifting schedules, will say, I'm shifting left. Um, <laughs> or what, All right. uh, And so it is, uh, and some, some of my uh, uh, collaborators here at UCSD have started testing 
speakers of military English. And in fact, they, they do say things that speakers of non-military English, civilian English, would find to be odd or ungrammatical. Uh, but they have a, a, a structured particular way of using left and right in their metaphors that have come from this artifact of this perpetual left-right stream calendar. Well, you already noted that for every rule we try to invent, there's going to be exceptions, and so we keep finding yeah, that. Yeah, well, humans, <laughs> humans keep innovating. That's the wonderful thing about the human mind is we, we have infinite possibility in there. I agree with that one. All right, Lara Bardisky, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape Podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been fun.